Straight ahead on Law and Crime Daily. R. Kelly is back on trial. From opening statements to herpes allegations and fan reactions. It's about the money. Prosecutors calling the R&B singer a predator. How the defense is fighting back. And Robert Durst faces cross-examination. The real estate heir now admitting he hasn't always told the truth. I lied in the trial in Dallas. The lies, the disappearances, and deaths surrounding Robert Durst. If in fact you had killed her, would you tell us? No. Law and Crime Daily, covering court cases from coast to coast. Welcome, everybody, to Law and Crime Daily. I'm Jesse Weber in our studios. Brian Buckmeyer is on assignment at R. Kelly's trial, and with us, as always, is Terry Austin. Testimony in the highly anticipated sex crimes trial of the R&B singer has begun. Now, cameras are not allowed in the courtroom, but Brian's there for all of it. Brian, paint the scene for us. What does it look like outside the courthouse, and what can you tell us about what's happening inside? So for those of you who don't know of the EDNY, the building right behind me, it's actually right across the street from a park called Cadman Plaza. And so we have a number of people just kind of hanging out, sitting in the plaza. While we're sitting here, you can hear people actually singing R. Kelly's song. Just moments ago, uh, we heard someone sing, I Believe I Can Fly. Uh, members of the Savage family, that is Joycelyn Savage's uh, family, that is an ex-girlfriend of R. Kelly, was living with him uh, since she was 19 and is now coming out through social media saying that she was a victim. Her family came in and we saw Gloria Allred walking hand in hand with the family going in. Now inside, we can't be in the court because of COVID restrictions. In fact, the jury's not even in the jury box. They're in the audience spread out. And so we're sitting in an overflow room with cameras all all over that room and we have one camera directed at R. Kelly. We can see a very stoic R. Kelly sometimes writing notes and whispering to his his counsel or maybe even co-counsel because it appears that he's taking a very hands-on approach to this case. We're not seeing any kind of outbursts or any kind of reactions when the allegations are put forward but he's definitely participating in his defense by helping out by giving a few notes here and a few words there. The story don't add up if you follow it it doesn't add up. The stories are different every time. I met him in the park. Then you write a book, you met him at a restaurant. Which one is it? You know, the story's not the same. You know, it's, it don't make sense at all. None of them. Not one of them. It's about the money. It's about. All right, so you see some fans there showing support for R. Kelly, but let's get to the arguments, Brian. Let's start with the prosecution. What did they have to say during their opening statement? The prosecution had, even in this public defender's opinion, a phenomenal opening statement. They started off, as you said, calling him a sexual predator, that he targeted these women and groomed them for his own sexual pleasure. But not just him, that his enterprise did that as well. That a system of runners, individuals who may run and do assignments for him or uh, pick up a girl here or drop them off there or pick up some food or clean up after him, uh, that runners, as well as producers and other individuals in his inner circle, that's what they're describing it as, uh, used his fame used his money to find and groom these women for his sexual pleasure uh, and that's what they came out with and then they listed line by line we got some of the first names of some of the alleged victims describing not only the acts that R. Kelly uh, allegedly put upon them but also how they are in, in, uh, instrumental to certain alleged crimes being the Mann Act or that of RICO charges. But we always know there are two sides to every trial, so we know the prosecution has a strong case. What did the defense say in their opening? So it's not just what they said, but how they said it. The defense started off really bumpy with an objection that was sustained, and that was kind of the tenor of their opening remarks. They started off by almost giving a resume of how good the defense attorneys were, how long they had practiced. And by the second defense attorney, the judge quickly shut that down then continued by trying their best to highlight some of the inconsistencies. Now, in my opinion at least, a lot of it was fluff, but some of it did start to kind of make sense as they talked about certain instances, specifically about one woman's allegations of being locked in a room and the fact that there was a phone in that room, that she had a phone, and the woman's allegations that she was forced to pee in a cup. 
The defense came out trying to explain that, that R. Kelly is actually afraid of flying. So when he's on tour, he's doing it in a bus and tried to make the analogy that, like many of us who do road trips for long extended periods of time, we may have to pee in a cup uh, during that. And they were trying to make that correlation to try to take the sting out of all the allegations the prosecutions put forward. Now, a few other uh, objections that were had were the defense trying to almost vouch for how good the evidence was in their, in their case. And each and every time, the judge brought them up, sustaining the arguments. And it was definitely took a little bit of the wind out of their sail. And I think the jury saw that as well. Well, focusing on the defense, R. Kelly's defense attorney, Thomas Far Farinella, he provided us with this statement, quote, at this point, the public has only heard one side of the story in this case, and that is about to change in the coming weeks. We look forward to the truth and the facts coming to light as the defense will continue to vigorously defend Mr. Kelly. After all, the RICO enterprise is based on a series of independent relationships and events that the government is trying to patch together like different types of fabrics and trying to pass it off as silk. Okay, so let's get into this. Terry, let's break down that RICO or racketeering charge. Very unique. It encompasses 14 underlying acts. Does the state have to prove all of that in order to secure a conviction on racketeering? That's an excellent question, Jesse, and the answer is no, they do not. Under the 1970 RICO Act, they only need to prove more than one of those underlying acts. And we know already we have a number of acts from the 14 counts. We have bribery, exploitation of a child, kidnapping, forced labor. We even have six acts of violation of the Mann Act, which is basically transportation of girls for prosecution. So they just need to prove two of those underlying acts. And they have acts ranging from 1994 all the way through 2018. So they can select the ones they want to try to really enforce. And also they have multiple women who are saying that they were victims of these crimes. And actually, Jesse, this was a very smart right. move on their part. So I think uh, they can have lots of evidence as far and as And I'm glad concerned. you mentioned that because, Brian, it's my understanding that Jane Doe 4 testified today. What did you learn? Yeah, so Jane Doe number four testified, and one thing that we learned that we were not supposed to learn, uh, I forgot to mention this in defense's opening statements, they actually named her, not just her first name, but her last name as well. Of course, we won't do that because of the protections uh, that victims in this situation deserve and have, right. but that was a big hiccup in the defense's opening statements. So we learned her name, we learned about her relationship, and we learned about how R. Kelly allegedly took her virginity as a 16-year-old girl and knowing that she was 16 because she provided an ID and said, this is uncomfortable, I'm underage. And mm -hmm. R. Kelly's response, according to the prosecution, was, what does that mean? Tell people you're 19, pretend you're 21, right. and let's keep doing this. Wow. Uh, absolutely incredible, and there's still so much to go. Uh, so still ahead on Law & Crime Daily, Robert Durst is back on the witness stand for another round of questions, but this time by the prosecution. But first, more on R. Kelly, the shocking rulings made in court before the jury was brought in. Our reporters on the ground bringing you exclusive coverage. That's next. Welcome back, everybody. Shocking allegations are continuing to pour out of the sex crimes trial for R&B singer R. Kelly. Law and Crimes Managing Editor Adam Classfield is there in Brooklyn. Adam, it's good to see you. A lot to talk about. First, let's talk about there was a discussion about how herpes could play a role in this evidence. Talk about that. Well, the biggest thing to come out today on that subject was the fact that R. Kelly's motions to suppress that evidence and to dismiss those counts failed. The judge, Judge Donnelly, quickly uh, rejected those, and it's been long alleged and now was spoken in front of the jury, alleged that R. Kelly uh, transmitted and infected herpes to uh, multiple minor victims. Well, you know, what's also very strange is that you're hearing a lot of big names. And in fact, Aaliyah, Aaliyah, the singer who tragically passed away in a plane crash in 2001, it's my understanding she plays a very crucial role in this case as well. How is that so? Absolutely. Well, this is in one of the names that came out during the prosecution's opening statements. Uh, one of the biggest parts of what they claimed to the jury is that he had a secret marriage to Aaliyah after she got pregnant at the age of 
15. She was a minor. And prosecutors allege that essentially he, uh, it, to cover this up, to make, to have spousal privilege and avoid uh, prosecution for this, uh, that they uh, had a secret marriage through a fake ID. Yeah, you just can't make this stuff up. Uh, Adam, great reporting. Thank you so much. We can't wait to have you back to talk more about this trial. Um, I want to bring back in co-host Terry Austin to talk more about R. Kelly's trial. Now, Terry, how do you think that this trial is going to differ from Kelly's trial back in 2008 on child pornography charges where he was acquitted? How is it going to be different? I think it's going to be very different. There were 21 counts initially, but then it was reduced to 14. But as you say, those were on child pornography. And there was a tape that was introduced, but it was very grainy. And I don't think the jury really got a good sense of what was going on. And then in that case, the victim also decided that she was not going to appear. So I think that hurt the case, and he got acquitted. This is very, very different. The racketeering charge is one of the biggest differences, because we have so many witnesses that could possibly testify, and we have a greater period of time. So the prosecution is going to have plenty of evidence. And then, Jesse, I also think that we now have all of the results of the Me Too movement. We've seen what can happen with the Weinstein trial. We've seen what did happen with the Cosby trial, even though he won on the appeal. But we know that women and other victims have found their voices. So I think that's going to be a big difference in this case as well. All right. So you have the same defendant, but very different times and circumstance. Okay. We also have Brian Buckmeyer, of course, on the ground as well. Now, Brian, also, before the openings, the judge made a number of rulings. Tell us about that. Absolutely, Jesse. So, motions in limine were made and decided, but before they got to that, the motion to dismiss was denied. A written decision will be given at a different time. Of course, we're going to have that for our viewers when that comes up. But in terms of Jane Doe, uh, number seven, where the incident happened in 1991, allegedly, the judge ruled that the witness, the sexual assault can come in, but anything that happened prior to that night, to that, uh, 1993 date before the alleged uh, enterprise started, that actually cannot come in. To Jane Doe number nine, which allegedly happened in 1995, that's when we start talking about the immiscibility of the herpes, because the judge said that went to counts 12, 14, and 6 through 9. Also felt that, based on the allegations, this wasn't too sensational for them to bring in the issue of herpes. To, J to Jane Doe number 11 and 12, that evidence came in, again, about the herpes and the evidence of the settlement as evidence of concealment or furthering the enterprise. And lastly, as to Jane Doe 14, the incident that happened in 2008, allegedly, that is supposedly to be direct evidence or means or methods of the enterprise, and that's the allegations of imprisonment, mm -hmm. and those are allowed to come in. Those were the decisions made by the judge just prior to opening statements. A little complicated case, but also I want to ask you, Brian, real quick before I let you go, um, R. Kelly's demeanor, it's something we're not going to be able to see, but you get a sense of what was his reaction, what did, was his demeanor like in court real quick? Very stoic, especially when you think of some of the allegations where he's accused of keeping a woman imprisoned in a room for three days and having her pee in a bottle. Uh, the allegations of raping, especially when Jane Doe number four was on the stand, not a lot of reaction from him. Very calm, cool, collected, sending notes to his, his, his attorneys. I think he understood what this case is about and that all eyes are going to be on him through this case. Yeah, that's for sure. Brian, thank you so much. Coming up on Law and Crime da Daily, did Robert Durst really kill them all? The final questions his attorneys asked him and his response that left us all speechless. And welcome back, everybody. Robert Durst is back on the stand for a sixth day of questioning as the real estate heir tries to prove his innocence. Now, Durst is on trial for the murder of his friend Susan Berman in December 2000. He was arrested in 2015. That's the same year that the HBO series The Jinx aired. Durst had agreed to sit down with the show's director for several interviews. And in the final scene of the docuseries, Durst is heard talking to himself in a bathroom, not knowing his mic was still hot. Durst says the now infamous line, killed them all, of course. On the stand, defense attorney Dick DeGuerin asked Durst what he meant by that statement. What's the situation when you're speaking to yourself? It seems I 
talk to myself about my thoughts. So some of what I'm thinking, I do not say it out loud. Later uh, in the recording of your talking to yourself, you also said, kill them all, of course. Yeah. What did you mean by that? What I did not say out loud, or perhaps I said very softly, is they'll all think I killed them all, of course. The defense attorney then asked Durst about his 2015 interrogation with prosecutor John Lewin. Prosecutors say that Durst admitted to wanting to accept a plea deal just so he could get out of his cell in Louisiana. When Mr. Lewin questioned you for several hours, almost three hours, what was going through your mind? And I should do a plea bargain with these people. What kind of plea bargain? Any kind of plea bargain that would get me out of Louisiana. If I had been offered the right deal, I would have confessed to murdering Susan Berman, to murdering Kathy Durst, to murdering John Lennon, to murdering Jack Kennedy, to murdering Morris Black, and to murdering anybody else whose name I could think of. All right, when we come back, cross-examination. How will Robert Durst hold up when it's the prosecution that's asking the questions? Stay with us. Welcome back. Cross-examination is underway for the real estate heir accused of murdering his best friend. This is the moment that we've all been waiting for since this trial started, especially for Prosecutor John Lewin, and he didn't disappoint. Would you lie under oath to help your case? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Have you lied thus far during your testimony at this trial? No. If you had killed her, you wouldn't tell us, correct? Correct. So given that that's the case, would you agree then that for every important issue in this case, Mr. Durst, in essence, you've just said you're not to be believed? No. C can you explain why you say no? And if you can't, you can just say I can't explain it. A hypothetical, did you kill Susan Berman, is strictly a hypothetical. I did not kill Susan Berman, but if I had, I would lie about it. Oh boy, Durst now admits to lying on the stand during his first murder trial in Texas. Now, he was acquitted of the murder of his neighbor Morris Black in Galveston. Durst now says he didn't tell the truth about his whereabouts when Susan Berman was murdered. Did you tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth during your trial testimony in Galveston? I lied in the trial in Galveston. I said I was in Northern California when Susan Berman was murdered, and that was a lie. Is that the only lie you told during that trial? The only one I'm aware of. And Lewin went even further, pressing Durst about his public lies. Durst denied for years that he wrote the infamous cadaver note, but did say that whoever wrote that note must have killed Susan Berman. Isn't it true, Mr. Durst, that the reason you've been caught in so many of your lies is that they're just not very good? Well, you bring up the cadaver note. And I had to lie about the cadaver note because anyone who saw the cadaver note would have to believe that I was with Susan Berman when she died. Well, it's worse than that, Mr. Durst. You previously said on multiple occasions that, quote, that's a note only the killer could have written. Correct? 
That's what Andrew asked me to say. That, that's another thing that Mr. Jarecki asked you to say. Did he ask you to say it when you were speaking to me as well in 2015? And you hear Durst there blaming the Jinx director for what he said. Terry, absolutely incredible. But if we get into this, Lewin's cross-examination, it's mostly focused on multiple inconsistencies in Durst's statements over the years. But which ones are really important? And which ones might the jury just overlook or kind of excuse? Well, there are so many inconsistencies, Jesse, both in public, both under oath, both when he's talking to Jarecki, the director for the Jinx. But I think the most important inconsistency, obviously, is the cadaver note, because that is the note that really does implicate him in the death of Susan Berman. And the fact that he had to admit he wrote that note, because clearly he misspelled the word Beverly and the handwriting was the same as the envelope. I think the one area, and this is just a small criticism, because I think Lewin is doing an amazing cross-examination, one of the best crosses I've ever seen. But I would not have started out talking about the games that he played when he was a child with his mother. Who cares if it is, you know, Uno or whether or not he played other games? And apparently Uno wasn't around when his mother uh, passed away. But I think that's a very small point, and I think I would have saved that or not even talked about it at all. But he brought that up in the very beginning of the cross, and it's one of the things that I think he should have saved for later or, as I said, not said anything at all. And you make a great point, but maybe him admitting to lying about some things makes him more credible in the line of the jury. I don't know. We'll wait and see. Terry, thank you so much. That's all we have for you. Thanks for joining us here on Long Prime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.